Welcome to the Dr. Ed Show. I'm Dr. Edmund Sokowski. You know, on this show, we do not diagnose, nor do we treat, but we hope to educate and inform to empower you to be in charge of your own health and wellness. And we're doing that today with my special guest, Dr. Joseph Pereka. Dr. Joe, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you for having me, Dr. Ed, my friend. I really appreciate it. Dr. Joe <laughs> is just a multitude of pillars of information. I, I, I couldn't say it any better. He knows so much about so many things about your health and your wellness. And Dr. Joe is a chiropractor of many, many years. We're going to talk about mm -hmm. that. And he has the Pereka Chiropractic Center in Bel Vernon. Correct. And for full disclosure, I am a patient. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what brought you to become a chiropractor, Dr. Joe? Well, when I was very young, I was 13 years old. I was uh, in heavily involved in wrestling, and I would always read these magazines that are called Muscular Development and Strength and Health. And invariably, I'd read this article and I'd say, boy, that's interesting. That's something that I would like to do is, you know, work with muscles and nerves and things like that. And I would look at the author, and nine times out of ten, it was a chiropractor. So at, at that time, when I was 13 years old, I made up my mind. I said, I want to be a chiropractor. <laughs> and uh, that's what led me into my interest in chiropractic and, and health. That's actually fascinating to be so young and know where, what direction you want to go I to. I was fortunate. <laughs> I, I always think I was you know, still in college and not <laughs> figuring it out yet. <laughs> but but uh, it, chiropractic care is so important because I always make this comment, we're nothing but a tube of a fluid and electricity. But why, why is that important if we were a tube? Well, you know, we have this thing called the, the life force or the spark of life, which n nobody knows what it is. It comes innately. I, in my belief, it comes from God, our Creator, and it travels through the nervous system. And the, one of the first things that's formed when we're forming in the womb as embryos is the nervous system, the primitive streak. And um, that nervous system directs and controls the development of all the other parts of the body, all the other organs. So if you don't have nerve flow correct, then, then nothing works right in the body. So you have to have optimum nerve flow to the muscles, the joints, every cell, organ, tissue of the body has to have 100% proper nerve flow. So as we develop in the womb, once we're born, we have this thing called the skeleton, the skeletal structure, and we have the skull and the spinal column that protects this very vital structure inside called the central nervous system. And from the central nervous system, that's kind of like a, a tree branch. You, or a tree trunk, I should say, and then you have branches coming off of that. That's the peripheral nerves. That supplies every cell, organ, tissue of the body. So if you have a uh, pinched nerve or if you have impedance of nerve flow to those organs or those tissues, they don't function what, correctly. But a good analogy being a garden hose that gets a kink in it and the water doesn't flow. That's a great analogy. We've used that analogy for years in chiropractic. So, so it, th that's important because the nutrients, the electricity, and we are a body of electricity. Yes. I mean, I mean it's, it, people should really realize that. You can take an EKG, an EEG. Right. That's all measuring of electrical potential. Exactly. You know, your, your, your heart is, is producing this electricity. For your sure. Your brain is. It's being transferred to every organ, yeah. every cell in your body. And if that gets impaired... And that's why the thyroid is so, so important, because that's the, the regulator of all that energy. Exactly, exactly right. And, uh, you know, it comes, uh, if you want to go a little higher, the pituitary, the master gland, but then the thyroid is very, it plays a very uh, vital role there. Uh, but anything you do this right here, that's a miracle, that you can move your, your finger like that. And the reason you can do that is because of electricity. Because an impulse is being sent. Exactly. It says, hey, you've got a thought process, creates an electrical potential, and then you can say, oh, I can do this. Exactly right. It creates what we call an action potential, and it allows the muscles to work. And if that, if there's not 100% flow, nerve flow to this, then this doesn't work 100%, just like your liver or your heart or your kidneys. So you talk about this skeletal structure. That's what supports all of this. Mm hmm and some creatures have their skeleton on the outside, we have it on the inside. Right. And there is a, a big difference in how things work when it's like that. Right. So if that skeletal structure isn't in the right alignment, all these problems begin to occur. Exactly right. You know, structure determines function. So if, if everything's not aligned correctly, 
then we're going to get impedance, we're going to get pressure on the nerves, we're going to get less than 100% nerve flow to whatever that nerve goes to, whatever organ it goes to, and then we're going to have less than 100% optimal function. So what are some of the things in our daily lives that can create this misalignment? There's a lot of things. Uh, gravity is one. We live in an environment of gravity. Uh, physical activity, bending, lifting, twisting. Emotional things, stress can cause problems like that. Uh, nobody's under stress no, anymore. No, no stress at all <laughs> these days. <laughs> so, uh, and chemical things. So when you're talking about nutrition and biochemistry, those can all cause problems with, with nerve flow and with the, with the body itself, with the structure. So you mentioned movement can create this problem. Could lack of movement do the same thing? Absolutely. Lack of movement can... Uh, well, you know to yourself that if you break your arm and you have your arm in a cast for six weeks, when they take the cast off, what's what's it look like, the arm, it compared to the other one? It shrivels up. Yeah, it's atrophy shrinks up, shrivels away, and the muscles are weaker. So absolutely, we need movement. Movement is life, basically. Uh, if there's no movement, there's no life. Uh, in the olden days in medicine, when you broke something, you stayed off of it, and then they started to realize that that's <laughs> the exact opposite of what we should be doing. You exactly. need to put that force on there in order for the, everything to start to regenerate and rebuild. For sure. If someone gets a, a hip replacement, look, they have them up walking. You know, as soon as they're out of recovery, they have them up walking and moving around and putting force on there. And uh, For instance, like a, a broken bone, we know through Wolf's Law that if you put pressure on a bone, it gets stronger. It lays down more bone. So you probably want to get, as soon as you can, get the stress and the pressure on the bone. But you've got to have movement. And that's pretty much, chiropractic's all about movement, like movement in the vertebrae, for instance, because your back doesn't really go out, per se. I mean, it doesn't, it, you'd have to tear ligaments for it to go out. It'd have to be dislocated. But what happens is, uh, if you can imagine, your, your spine, those joints, those spinal joints are like a, a train on tracks, okay? And they're supposed to move a certain way in flexion, extension, lateral bending, rotation. So my job is to find out if it's stuck. And if it is, where is it stuck? Is it stuck in flexion, extension? So that's why when we put you on the, the instrument, the computerized instrument uh, called the Pro Adjuster, we're checking all those different areas. That has a, a piezoelectric sensor in the handpiece that tells me where you're locked up, which, which vertebra has more stress or... Um, are locked more versus the other vertebra. So once we find out where it's locked and where there's lack of motion, then we put a force in there that unlocks it. The instrument will shut down automatically when it feels the joint unlock or the muscle release. Then we know the motion's restored. Once motion's restored, then no normal nerve function is restored. Yeah, the, the, the vertebra that we have, our whole s spine, mm -hmm. everybody refers to it as, it's kind of in individual bones that have tissue in between. Can you kind of explain that to us? Yeah. There are individual segments. For instance, the, the neck, the cervical spine has seven, seven segments. The thoracic spine has 12. The lumbar spine has five segments. And then when you have two segments, two bony segments interposed with a disc, a disc is like a shock absorber in between. That's called a motor unit. And when you have two segments, there's, there's half of the intervertebral foramen, that's the hole the nerves come out, is on one segment, the other half's on the other, so this is where the nerve comes through. So if that joint is locked in rotation or flexion or extension, it's going to put pressure on what's inside of this intervertebral foramen, and part of that, what's inside there's the nerve, so it puts pressure on all this. There's structure. a bundle of nerves that are, that are coming yes. through there. There's, there's a, a, a big bundle of nerves, there's sensory nerves, there's motor nerves, there's all types of nerves. And, and that's, if you have this impingement, then mm -hmm. what's the medical term for this impingement? Well, chiropractically, we, we call it a subluxation. That's kind of a, a, a vague term, but that's what, what we coined it as subluxation. Medically, we just, we call, uh, medically, they call it segmental dysfunction, where the, the joint is dysfunctional, it's not working the right way. And that's when you can start getting pain or lack of the ability to even move. Right. You, you, lo you have loss of motion, that creates pain, that creates inflammation then because you get some tissue damage in there too. And what that is swelling and... Yes, and you have the swelling, redness, heat, something pain. Something <laughs> we call cytokines. Yeah. Tell us a little about what cytokines are. Well, cytokines are signaling molecules that if there's um, inflammation in the area, tissue damage, it could be caused by uh, just damage itself like when you sprain an ankle to the tissue. It could be caused by pathogen, maybe an infection. And once this... Um, 
pathogen or this tissue damage occurs, it sends off these signals through what we said cytokines. Uh, there's different ones. There's IL-6, there's IL-8, there's IL-10, there's a bunch of them. That stands for interleukin, right? 6, 8, 10, 4. And once it sends off the signal, primarily IL-6, the, in the venules, there's uh, neutrophils, and the neutrophils will be signaled to come into the tissue. It comes into the tissue, and it gobbles up the uh, damaged tissue or the pathogen if there's an infection in like there. Like a Pac-Man. Like a Pac-Man. And that sends another signal off. And when it sends that other uh, cytokine off, it brings in these monocytes, again, from the venules. Mm -hmm. The monocytes mature into macrophages. The macrophage, like a big Pac-Man, eats the whole thing and it drains out through the lymphatic system, and that's how we resolve. So these cytokines are important for our recovery. Yes. But if they become overabundant or out of control, then they actually create more damage. Yes, if they become overabundant or out of control and it outstrips the ability of the macrophages to clean up the mess, then we have a bunch of neutrophils that just sit in there and they, they die, they go through a process called apoptosis, and it's like cell suicide. And when they die, it releases all these acids and it's like bleach and these lysosomes have all these caustic chemicals in it causes more damage more tissue damage then then you have more uh, neutrophils that come in but there's not enough cleanup there so it just perpetuates it's a feed forward system where you keep getting more and more and more inflammation and and, and during this pandemic that we had thrown upon us yeah um thrust upon us is probably a better way to say it <laughs> um that was pretty much ignored. That, that was exactly what you explained to us was ignored. It was ignored. Uh, they were focused on other things, uh, mm -hmm. external things. Not, you know, we have we're a self-healing organism. If we cut our finger, you don't have to think about it. It heals on its own. As long as those nutrients are getting to where they e need to be. Exactly. As long as the body's functioning properly. You know, if, take for instance a diabetic. They don't heal real well because that process is interrupted. Um, but, you know, when, they, when it was said that your immune system didn't count, <laughs> you, you needed some other external thing, you know, to, to make you healthy, I knew uh, somebody was not either misinformed or, or not genuine, not telling the or, truth. Or had a motive. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so are there certain professions that are more prone to having this misalignment? Absolutely. Um, um, I hate to say it, dental <laughs> professional. Oh, yeah. I'm always in a hug a tree <laughs> position. Oh, yeah. You're, as you're down this way, you get what's known as very commonly, it's a um, upper cross syndrome. Because what happens is these muscles get tighter and stronger. And then these back here and here, they get stretched. And then your head's forward all the time. So it brings everything like this forward. Uh, you see a lot of people that work all day long on the computers have the same kind of problem. And now these young kids with text neck, you know, <laughs> same text thing. Neck, yeah. Yeah. It's a very common problem. So uh, people that are working out, let's say, being a lumberjack, mm -hmm. are, are there certain problems that they might have over somebody who's driving a truck every day? Yeah. They have a different set of problems, of course, because, you know, bending, lifting, and twisting are the three most damaging movements to the spine. You know, what's a lumberjack doing all day? He's bending, lifting, twisting. So they end up uh, wearing out the lower part of the spine. In the bottom, those last discs, like the L5, L4 discs, they get worn, and they get thin, and then they get weak, and then they bulge or herniate, and that's a, a whole different set of problems there. So when something like that happens generally speaking you're being set up for surgery uh you know there's times when surgery is needed there's definitely times uh when we have an emergency center there's really only three indications for surgery one is if you can't get out of bed and function number two is if you can't move your bowels or urinate that's called cauda equina syndrome that's an emergency and the third one is if you start to have um, weakness in your limb or atrophy where the muscle shrivels up like we talked about with the cast on the arm, those are the only three indications really for surgery. Most, most people with herniated discs can be handled conservatively and they will heal in time. It takes time, but they'll heal. Um, 
I've had, you know, in 38 years, I've been in practice for 38 years, I've obviously had to refer a number of patients out for surgery, but it's, it's a, a lot more rare than people would think. So uh, I'm going to cite an example of something that I experienced. I had a dog that I was putting in my car one time, so I'm on my knees, mm -hmm. kind of like not on touching the ground, but bent in that position. Right. And I went to pick him up, and I'm putting him in the back seat of the car, and so I'm facing this way, and he's facing that way, and he darts this way. <laughs> so I go to catch him, and when I, when I went like this, yeah. pain down my back, I couldn't even get up. Right. You know, my first, I was living in Arizona at the time. My first reaction was, <laughs> was to get to the chiropractor, which right. I did, and it, it, it probably took two weeks before I was yeah. out of pain. I didn't run yeah. to a physician, and I didn't say, give me painkillers. I didn't right. say, give me muscle relaxes. Right. I, I, is, was that more muscle than spine? Yes. That's called a muscle impairment. When someone comes into my office and I'm doing an exam, what I'm looking for is, is it a disc problem, a joint problem, or a muscle impairment? It's usually a combination of all three, but I want to see which one's dominant. So what happens in that case, we have different uh, sensors in our muscles um, called Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles, and if you do s real rapid movement, it can cause a strain in the muscle. So that's an, in a, in a spasm, which is an involuntary muscle contraction. And what you probably had, if it took two weeks, you probably had a grade two strain. Grade one strain takes about four days. Grade two is around two weeks. And grade three is longer, maybe four to six weeks. Yeah, it really surprised me because you know I was somebody that rode my mountain bike just mm -hmm. about every day. I hiked a mountain every day. Yeah. And, and you know, so, so you have a certain amount of muscle strength there. Yeah. But it was a movement that I didn't do every day, I guess. Yeah, exactly right. And those uh, sensors, you know, they call them proprioceptors, technically. Uh, they can be thrown off no matter what, no matter what, how good a condition you're in, because we're wired a certain way. So if I have a gallon of milk here, or say, say a half a gallon of milk, it's a paper carton, I can't see what's inside of it. I think it's full. I go to pick it up, I think it's full, but it's empty. What happens? It comes up like that, you know, and that, that's an easy way to cause problems, to cause a muscle strain, things like that. So Dr. Joe, how do I know whether I should go to a physician if I have something like that or go to a chiropractor? Well, chiropractors are, are really trained to handle those musculoskeletal type problems, like with muscles uh, and discs and nerves and, and joints. That, that I, I, my philosophy is I start at the most conservative level first. So chiropractic is the most conservative. If that doesn't work, then the next rung up is maybe some medication. And if that doesn't work, the next rung up is surgery. You know, so that's my philosophy. Start at the most conservative level first, chiropractic, then medication, then surgery. So there's times that um, I do have to refer patients if they have a, a severe radiculopathy, like pain down the arm, and I know it's, the inflammation is already advanced beyond what I can do, I'll go ahead and and send them to the doctor, they'll give them maybe, um, you know, some kind of anti-inflammatory steroid or something. And believe me, and if, if you do the right thing, they're better in a few days, three or four days. Uh, so there are times when you need medication uh, when, or when medication works better than, than trying to do it. Well, that manually. steroid would be suppressing those cytokine response. Exactly. That's exactly what it does. Yeah. And, and it gives the body a chance because the body's still healing itself. But what it does is it breaks that cycle with the cytokines allows the body to reset and and the body produces these things called prostaglandins mm -hmm. too so it it stops the prostate blocks the prostaglandin production and then the body is allowed to heal on its own yeah so sometimes you know medication is important yeah absolutely but you know you can relax those muscles by soaking in hot water yes you can use a little bit of epsom salt right and and make that procedure even a little more effective Absolutely. When it comes to the muscles, uh, most of the time, 99 times out of 100, you don't need you. You can soak it. You can get chiropractic. Uh, what I'm talking about with the anti-inflammatories, if it's affecting the nerve and you have nerve swelling, that type of thing, you want to get swelling down in the nerve root, then that's where I've found that the medication works the best. Yeah. So, should chiropractic care be used as a preventative? Yeah, it, I, it should be used as a preven preventative, and because of the, um, the technology that came out that I have now uh, in the office, 
we can scan down the spine and we can catch problems before they become a, a, a big problem. We can catch them while it's, they're just starting out. So when we scan down the spine, if I find that you know, C4 is locked on C5, I can unlock it and get it back to normal function and then you're on your way and you don't need the, uh, you don't have to worry about it, you know, it's developing into something that starts to give you pain down the arm or starts to give you dysfunction where you, you can't use your arm, things like that. So I saw you this week, and we'll talk a little bit about me. Not, not too <laughs> <Yeah>. great detail. <laughs> but in any case, uh, you said, boy, your scan looks pretty good today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means that when I scan down with it, it looks like a, a little tuning fork, basically. They put a little pressure in on the spine on each segment. And if those segments are all moving well in relation to one another, I get a little waveform that comes up on the computer screen. And if that wave is like a nice, tight, condensed rainbow, then I know everything's working right. And if it's under a certain, um, if it's under, if it's under a certain, um, what do I want to say, height, you know, it has to be low under a certain line there. And so if, if everything is a condensed, nice, tight rainbow, then, and it's where it should be, then I know those joints are moving properly and functioning properly. Yeah, so I, I go generally every week. Occasionally I have to go into the office on a day that I have scheduled with you and I and I can't make it and I notice the difference and I'm not a couch potato right definitely not a right. couch potato <laughs> and uh, I'm moving all the time and sure. you know I, I do when the weather's nice ride my bike I try to walk I do Pilates I do all these things right but that alignment is so critical and like you say my job is this I'm mm -hmm. in this position half the right. day and it, it takes a toll on that spinal cord. And then as you start to age, you get some compression there as well. Right, you know, we're all living in an environment of gravity and, and, and we never win that battle with gravity. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> it gets us. It gets us. <laughs> <laughs> How important is hydration? Hydration is very important because everything in the body, all these chemical reactions take place with water. And, you know, the discs are nothing more than, they're, they're Basically, they're mostly water. Your body is mostly water. You know, muscles are 70% water. So in order for anything to function f uh, from a chemical standpoint, biochemical standpoint, even from a structural standpoint, you've got to be hydrated. So I'm drinking tea, coffee. I mean, I'm not talking about me because I don't. Yeah. I drink tea and coffee. Uh -huh. I don't drink alcohol, but yeah, people do. Mm -hmm. uh, soda pop, whatever. Am mm -hmm. I hydrated with those things? You know, the best hydration is water <laughs> because, you know, coffee can dehydrate you. Of course, alcohol, even though you don't drink alcohol, alcohol will really dehydrate you. Tea, um, that can be dehydrating also. And so you want to get water in. And, you know, all the experts say drink half your body weight in ounces of water. I don't know if that's really accurate. Yeah, I haven't that's seen any tough studies. To, that's tough to do. Yeah, I haven't seen any studies on that. But basically, when you're thirsty, drink water. That's the best guideline I can give you. Drink yeah, water. Yeah, if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. That's right. You're um, you're way dehydrated when you're thirsty. <laughs> yeah. But uh, like I said, I've never seen any peer-reviewed studies on, you know, the half your body weight in ounces of water. But it's a nice, simple guideline to follow. I, I kind of go with a liter of water for every hundred pounds, on, on, unless you're active. Yeah. Or you're in a hot climate. Right. Oddly enough, even a cold climate could dehydrate you pretty quickly. No, absolutely, because you're using a lot more energy, a lot more ATP, that's our body's natural energy, just to keep you warm. And, you know, when you shiver, that's to keep you warm. So you're going to be needing, you're going to need more water, for sure. The only downside is you are running to the bathroom up yeah. far more than, <laughs> than on average. Mm -hmm. But that actually becomes a good thing because you're eliminating all these toxins when you're doing that. Yeah, because you eliminate toxins largely through urine, through bowel movements, through sweating, through breathing, respiration. Yeah, people don't realize how much you, you expel just by breathing. Oh, when you're sleeping eight hours at night, you're going to lose a pint through breathing. That's a lot. <laughs> you don't realize that. But, uh, you know, get up in the morning and just breathe in a mirror. You fog the mirror, you see how much... Water's coming out of there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and and with that is toxins. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's so important because health is your ability to excrete toxins from your body and take in the right nutrients, and then 
you know, if your body's aligned, like we talked about, then you can assimilate, digest and assimilate and absorb those nutrients. If, you're, if your body's not aligned properly and your digestive tract isn't getting the right nerve flow, you're not absorbing, you get what's known as malabsorption syndrome, you can eat the best diet that you want, but you're not going to absorb those nutrients. So you're not what you eat, you're what you absorb. And what you eliminate. And what you eliminate, exactly. How young can you be to start chiropractic care? You know, we have, um, with, we've treated patients, little babies, two, three days old, you know, and, and we've, our oldest patient was probably 100. <laughs> so there's, as long as you have a spine, you can be treated. And of course, we use different techniques, but I, I only, use, only use the instrument on, on infants um, and usually only use the instrument on somebody that's 90 or above. But I do... Um, You're speaking of a chiropractic hammer? Yeah, the, the pro adjuster that we, we yeah. use on you. But I still do, I still do a fair amount of uh, uh, manual manipulation. Like we had a, um, a football player in last night and put a plug in for Bell Vernon High School. They're playing for their second state championship in a row. I had a couple of those guys in yesterday. And, you know, they like manual adjusting, so I do manual adjusting on them, along with the instrument. But it, um, I, I don't do as much. When I first started, I did all manual because I didn't have the technology. But now that I, I have the, the first technology. chiropractor hammer was designed by a dentist. That, it's exactly right. That, uh, yeah. that uh, is called an activator. Yeah. And it was a dental impactor. They put a rubber tip on it. And I don't know, probably some chiropractor took credit for it. I yeah, don't know. Who knows? No. <laughs> but it was a dental <laughs> instrument. <laughs> you know, Dr. Joe, we're at, we're at our, our break here. So I just want to remind everybody that, that you can actually listen to, to Dr. Joe. He was on my radio show, The Dr. Ed Show. And you can go to rumble.com, search Dr. Ed Show, and then put in Dr. Joe's name in there. And you could listen to that conversation as well. And we're actually going to be doing some upcoming shows and, and uh, about nutrition and wellness yeah. and detoxing and so forth. It's really, really critical. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, um, and in fact, we're going to be doing a panel with uh, two of prior guests on this show, uh, Dr. Arciero yeah. and Dr. Fiber. Right. And we're all going to be a, a panel together. I think it's going to be <laughs> fascinating. It'll be fun. Yeah. One big happy family. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back in a couple of minutes on Dr. Ed's show. Welcome back to the Dr. Ed Show. I'm Dr. Edmund Sokowski, and we're here with Dr. Joe Pareko. We're talking about your health and your wellness through chiropractic care. And Dr. Joe, we, we gave a pretty good, I think, expose on, on alignment and how important that is for flow of, of electrical potential, mm -hmm. flow of fluids, how all of our organs, if they don't have that, they die. Exactly right. And then you set, up, set yourself up for all kind of health problems. Let's focus a little bit, and, and we started to talk about this with, with cytokines, and mm -hmm. we talked about it with hydration, actually. How important it is to take in these nutrients, and as you said, it is important what you take in, but it's important mm -hmm. what you absorb. Right. And what your exactly. body can utilize exactly. and eliminate the things you don't need or shouldn't have. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a fine balance between getting rid of the toxins, excreting the toxins, and taking in the nutrients that we need as building blocks for building normal tissue and nerves and, and everything. And that balance word is a big and actually an important <laughs> word because that's really what it is. It's mm -hmm. balance, yes. homeostasis. Yeah, a big word. It's one of the first words you learn in physiology classes, homeostasis, balance. And, uh, you know, with, with chiropractic, what it is is it's a balance between you know, physical, which is keeping the, the spine, the skeleton aligned and keeping everything moving properly. Um, the mental aspect where you wanna, we have certain ways to decre decrease stress 
uh, and then we get into the chemical, the, the biochemical aspect, of nutrition, and that's what we're, I guess, segueing into now. Yeah, and, well, um, nu nutrition is like this generalized word, yes. uh, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Wh what would be your definition of nutrition? Nutrition is just getting the right raw materials or building blocks into the body, giving the body everything it needs to function normally. So it has to, you know, build proper tissues. Whether you're talking about, uh, you know, teeth or hair or, you know, the heart tissue, we have to get the proper raw materials. And you know, obviously, we get a lot of that from food, but we can't get it all from from food. Well, food isn't what it used to be. No. Let's put it that way. No. So it, it, it is a. Uh, wild-caught salmon the same as a farm-raised salmon? <laughs> no, they're very different because a wild-caught salmon uh, is going to eat algae and it's going to uh, produce what's called omega-3 fatty acids in abundance. And omega-3 fatty acids are really important for us in this modern day that we live in because we have such an abundance of junk food. Everything you see packaged in the store is loaded with omega-6 fatty acids. Yeah. So again, here's that balance, homeostasis. There has to be a balance between the omega-3 and the omega-6. Actually, there's a, a ratio that it that should occur. Exactly, and that ratio is way thrown off. If that ratio should be 3 to 1, actually, ideally, it should be 1 to 1. But you can get away with 3 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. But most of our diets now, this SAD diet, the standard American diet, it's thrown the balance off your maybe 20 uh, omega-6 to one omega-3. So, so omega-6 are known as inflammatory. Yes. A and you need a little bit of that. Yes. But anything that's fried or anything that comes from a vegetable oil, because uh, that's, that's, that's all omega you know, everybody uses this canola oil. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> canola oil stands for Canadian oil. Yeah. And it was uh, manufactured for the I industrial plants to lubricate their machinery. Right from a, a thing called the rapeseed or rapeseed, depending uh -huh. on how you want to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And it was never meant to be in, uh, uh, as a food or put into human consumption, but somehow it is. Yeah, well, it's uh, follow the money, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely correct because everything you see on the store shelves, if it's not around the perimeter of the grocery store, if it's not produce and meat and so forth, anything boxed uh, has you can almost bet it has omega-6s in because it's processed vegetable oil. Uh, they say that oil, processed vegetable oil consumption is the new smoking uh, because it's so damaging to our cells. When you have too much omega-6, which is these hydrogenated vegetable oils, your cell membranes, which should be fluid, which allows, allows oxygen in and nutrients in and allows the toxins to go out. Here we go again with nutrition and toxins. Uh, but, but what happens is the cell membrane, when you eat too many omega-6, it gets hard like this table, and it doesn't allow the oxygen and nutrients in, and it doesn't allow the toxins to go out. Actually forms a, a coating around the outside of your cell wall, yes. and your cell walls are permeable. They should allow things in and allow mm -hmm. things out, and suddenly they can't. And suddenly they can't because uh, they're damaged by these omega-6 vegetable oils. So that's probably the most uh, damaging thing that we do to us uh, ourselves as far as nutrition is we consume these vegetable oils because when you go out to the restaurant you don't know if they're using olive oil or well, well coconut you can, oil you can pretty <laughs> much guess and even nowadays yeah. you have to be careful with your olive oil because they're tainting it with other oils yeah yeah which they're i guess somewhat allowed to do to some degree yes uh and you're not getting a pure olive oil and then you got to Think about how, and you don't know this, but how, how is that olive raised? Is it the raised with, with glyphosates? Is it yeah, raised exactly. with other chemicals? And th all that gets absorbed in there. Like right. we, we talked about salmon, for example. Well, wild-caught salmon and farm-raised salmon are two different beasts. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talk about stress. Mm -hmm. These fish are combined in this little certain area. Right all competing for food that's thrown in that they don't no normally eat in the wild to begin with. Right, and the food, that's the key. They're giving them soy and corn. That's all high in omega-6. So what they can do is they, what they do is they eat this soy and this corn, and their metabolism is set up such that they become these factories, uh, tremendous factories for creating omega-6s. They, they amplifies the omega-6 that they got through the 
artificial food. And so they, the farm-raised salmon is just, it's an inflammatory food. And one thing they're lacking, and people may not realize this, although they watch our show or listen <laughs> to Dr. Ed on uh, AM 1250 mm -hmm. The Answer every Saturday morning, they eat something and they're pink mm -hmm. because of something called astroxanthin. Mm -hmm. That's right. We're mm -hmm. in a farm race situation. They're not eating the plankton and, 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 and the astroxanthin. They'll make them pink with food coloring. Yeah. <laughs> they're not, they don't have the natural pink from the astroxanthin, correct? And you know, now I trout's a little different. Trout has omega-3, even if they're farm raised, I, I, stay, I try to stay away from farm raised no matter what, but even if trout are farm raised, they still have a higher omega-3 level because their metabolism isn't set up like the salmon. So you're, you're pretty safe with trout, whether it's farm raised or wild caught, but I still like to eat wild caught all the time. And if, you, if anybody wants to, if our viewers want to get more information on this, they should read a book called Inflammation Nation. I think it's written by uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Childen, I think is his name. But it's called Inflammation Nation, and he, ex he explains it perfectly in there about the salmon wild caught versus the uh, farm raised. And that holds true for things like eggs. If you yes. have an egg, w a chicken normally eats grass and bugs. Mm -hmm. But if they're now eating soy and cor corn, you're not getting the egg that's naturally produced. Exactly right. It's the same situation as the farm salmon. You're getting a, a highly inflammatory food. And uh, you know we know inflammation is at the base root cause of all these chronic degenerative diseases. Wha that what's that fighting. saying with inflammation? Uh, where there's inflammation, there's disease. Where there's disease, oh, there's yeah, inflammation. Oh yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> that's a, that's an old adage, and yeah. it's it, it's so true. They, it's it's this loop where mm -hmm. you know you're not going to have one without the other. Yeah, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, and uh, you know we 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 live in such an inflammatory world because it's not just our our food and the vegetable oil we're talking about, but it's pollution in the air. You know, it's it's the it's in our water. It's it's the air we breathe, the food we and the clothes eat, you wear. The clothes you wear. I mean, they're all. Uh, if you take your clothes to the cleaners, they're going to use chemicals, and these chemicals are all very hazardous to us. Uh, there's uh, we're sitting in these chairs. They've been treated so that they're fireproof, probably or stain proof, Scotch guarded. That all outgasses into the air. We're using. Gets computers into your skin. Exactly. Computers, you're using the keyboard, those phthalates from the plastics, they outgas. You take them into your body and it, and it gets accumulated in your body. So yeah. And, and if you're not getting rid of them mm -hmm. through detox measures, right, uh, to some degree, they're just building up. In, or it, if you have higher amounts of fat in your body because fat stores mm -hmm. these, right. these toxins. Well, the fat is almost a, uh, sometimes it's a protective mechanism. If you have, a, if you have, have you heard of the term obesogens? Mm -hmm. So if you have, if you're taking in too many of these toxic chemicals, they're called obesogens, uh, it causes your body to produce fat because that fat absorb it surrounds that toxin to hold it at bay. It's a protective mechanism. So once you start to detox, then you have to make sure that those toxins are going out of your system either you know, through the kidneys or through the bowels. Because if not, if you start to lose weight and you're not detoxing, these chemicals that are uh, concentrated, say, in the bowel, for instance, they can recirculate back into the body, especially if you have something called leaky gut syndrome. They can recirculate back in. Ah, you bring up a big topic <laughs> here, uh, uh, leaky gut. And people may have heard that term, mm -hmm. uh, medically known as dysbiosis. Yes. So tell us about what leaky gut is. Leaky gut is um, normally the cells inside your inside your gut, small intestines, primarily intestines. They should have a tight junction. Those cells should be put together very tightly. Uh, but what happens with leaky gut? If we get a condition called dysbiosis, where there's a um, th there's an, an imbalance. Again, here comes the homeostasis. The <laughs> there's an imbalance of the gut bugs because there's a lot of bugs in our gut. There's a lot of bacteria, viruses. Um, fungi, all kinds of organisms. If that's thrown off, then it will cause certain chemicals like occlude and zonulin, those things, and it'll open up that tight junction. So when you open that tight junction up, uh, things can leak through that shouldn't leak through. 
So you eat a protein, and we could look at a protein like mm -hmm. fish, mm -hmm. meat, you know, red meat, whatever right. it is, eggs, veg vegetarian proteins, whatever yes. it is. That gets into your gut, and a certain amount of it's absorbed through mm -hmm. the cells in your gut and sort of uh, ends up in waste and whatever mm -hmm. processed through. But none of it should be leaking out. No, that protein that comes into your gut should be broken down into its smallest unit called an amino acid. And that amino acid should go through the gut, you know, one amino acid at a time. But a protein is just a string of amino acids. If you can imagine like a pearl necklace, each, each one of the pearls is like an amino acid. And the we whole have a necklace is a protein. essential and non-essential amino acids. Exactly. So tell us a little bit about what that is. Well, the essential amino acids you have to get through food. You can't manufacture it. Your body can't make it. The non-essentials your body can make. It, it so takes whatever and makes them on its own. It, it, it manufactures it on your own. But with these essential ones that you're required to have, you have for, to eat for full body function, if right. you're not consuming them as a nutrient, then your body's at a deficit. Exactly. Just like when we talked about the fatty acids, omega-6, omega-3, those are essential fatty acids. You have to take them in through food. So there's something called a complete protein mm -hmm. and a non-complete protein. Right. So I does that have something to do with all those amino acids? It does, yeah. A, a complete protein has the essential amino acids in, uh, and especially the branch chain aminos, which is uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Those three aminos are the branch chain aminos, and that kicks off this whole process called protein synthesis, and that's how your body makes muscle, through protein synthesis, a any, any type of tissue is made through protein including your skin including your skin how exactly. important is skin Healthy Skin's skin is very important uh, you know they say it's the largest organ in your body although I, I don't think it is the largest organ in your body but uh, if you um, open up the GI tract that's probably the largest portion uh, largest organ in your body but skin is very important because it's a barrier between the outside environment and our an internal environment. It's a, it's a protector. It's a very good protector, yes. Yet it functions on a number of other reasons uh, as far as sweating and allowing toxins to get out, yes. allowing you to stay cool or stay warm. Right. That, uh, or produce something called vitamin D3. Exactly right. Uh, when sunlight hits your skin, produces vitamin D3, which is uh, really technically not a vitamin, it's a hormone. It's a hormone, <laughs> yeah. So it turns on about 2,000 different genes in your body, it's really important, vitamin D. But your skin, let's get back to that. If you have a tear or a crack in there, maybe you have dry skin and it's cracking, then or then pathogens can get in that normally your skin would protect you from. Pathogens, that they're actually on you. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, we have uh, staph epidermidis, that type of thing. I mean, that gets into your bloodstream, it can cause problems. And, and your intestines, just like your skin, if you have leaky gut, it's like having a, you know, a crack in your skin and things leak through that shouldn't. So if you have a, a string of, uh, called a polypeptide, it's a string of amino acids that hasn't been broken down into the single amino acids, and a portion of that leaks through, that's a protein. Your body mounts an inflammatory reaction to that protein. And so if that little string, that polypeptide protein, looks just like the protein, say, uh, in your joints, in the synovial lining of your joints, then your body's not going to just attack what they think is an, in an invader of that undigested piece of food, but it'll attack your joints, and now all of a sudden, that's called rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> y you know, it, it's interesting. We hear these things, autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. and you hear it all the time. And, and whatever disease you have, we blame it on autoimmune disease. Right. And and we really can't do anything about it other than treat a symptom with an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. Basically, is mm -hmm. what the medical profession says. Yeah. I have a problem with that term autoimmune because to me, I don't see how a cell can, uh, your cell can attack one of your own cells. I can see if you gave me your kidney, yeah, I can see that attack my body attacking your kidney because that's right. a foreign b matter. Exactly. So I always look at autoimmune disease as collateral damage. There's some body inside your body, some foreign matter mm -hmm. that your body's trying to protect itself with. And then there's some yeah. collateral damage as a result. Would, uh, do you, do I you think have I think that's I, sort of I, a same opinion. I think that's exactly right. What autoimmune results from prolonged inflammation or prolonged infection? Uh, you know, some people have parasites. It's a long, like a prolonged infection. And we the medical profession ignores parasites for some reason. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, with the prolonged inflammation, 
what happens is when we were talking about inflammation earlier, there's other cells called dendritic cells. They have all these little fingers on them and it reaches out and it takes a sampling from the macrophage of what that damaged, either damaged tissue or pathogen was, okay? And then it hands it off to the adaptive immune system, you know, the T cells and the B cells, and they look at it and they examine it and they say, hey, you know what? This is us, this is our own tissue. Don't attack that, you know, don't make any soldiers to the B cells and, B cells and T cells. But after you have that process going on so long, after so many samples have been handed to them from the dendritic cells, invariably the body can make a mistake and say, this is foreign, this isn't us when it really is us. And they start to mount an attack, the T cells and the B cells, the antibodies made by the B cells and the T cells. And all of a sudden now it's attacking good tissue, your own tissue. So that's one of the theories, you know, and th there's, there's a diff couple different theories. The one I told you about before was molecular mimicry. That's like when that piece of undigested food looks just like the protein, like in your thyroid, and oh, now you got Hashimoto's because it's attacking your thyroid. And one of the big culprits there is gluten. Oh, with yeah. With the thyroid and Hashimoto's. Absolutely. And you know what's interesting about gluten is we've hybridized this wheat in the U.S. so many thousands of times. The gluten levels are so high. If we have friends that they can't eat gluten, but they go to Italy, and all of a sudden they can eat gluten and bread because they have the old ancient einkorn wheat and they don't spray it with glyphosate. That's yeah, the big it, thing. It's so amazing. Yeah. And, and I often tell people, you, you want to be able to eat wheat? Mm -hmm. Source it from Italy. That's right. You know, it's, the it's, old ancient einkorn wheat is, is pretty good. So we're <laughs> talking about these bugs, mm -hmm. and there are good bugs and bad bugs. Right. Bad bugs aren't always bad. You, you need a certain amount of those. It's when right. one gets out of control over the other is really right. when they become pathogenic and a problem. Well, why don't I just have a sterile gut or sterile skin? Well, because these bugs carry out functions for us, like create vitamins, like vitamin B. Or a lot of our B vitamins, B12, they're created by the bugs in the gut. They also uh, create neurotransmitters, like serotonin. Ninety percent of our serotonin is made in the gut by bugs. Um, there's a, a huge amount of immune tissue in the, in the gut that won't work without the bugs. We can't really, they're looking at some of these type 2 diabetics with the insulin resistance and they're finding out they're deficient in certain bugs. So 70% <laughs> of your immune system is your gut. Is that, I've yeah. heard that for many, many, many years. Is that true? That's very true, yes. So if you take something like an antibiotic, which, mm -hmm. which I cringe every time I have to prescribe it, <laughs> uh, but you have to do it sometimes. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm killing all, all the bacteria, reducing the good, and maybe the, the yeah, fungi or like the bad bacteria uh, overwhelm us. Yeah, because we, when we take antibiotics, even though they're necessary at times, it, it's like carpet bombing your intestines, and it's, it's killing all those organisms. And then, I mean, everyone's probably, or, or a lot of viewers have probably heard of C. diff. That's because those bugs take over. Not that they're always bad because you, we have them in there normally called commensal normal bacteria, but when they start to take over because some of the good bugs have been killed off that keep that population down, they take over and then C. diff is a bad, bad yeah, disease. C. diff can kill you. Yes. And, and everybody has it. You know, everybody's yes. worried about getting it. You already have it. You already it, have it. But yeah. there's only so much space and these bugs all compete for that space. Exactly. Right. And the stronger ones are going to... Right the ones in charge. Yes. And if you kill all that good bacteria, the ones that are harder to kill, which are generally more the pathogenic mm -hmm. ones, mm -hmm. are going to overpopulate, and then now you have uh, exactly. symptoms Exactly, that's what and happens. Disease. And, and we're more bug than we are human. Yeah. We have 10 times more bug cells in us than human cells. So uh, you, you were put on antibiotic because you had to be, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you're dictated by certain protocols and, mm -hmm. and, and certain diseases and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what do you do about it afterwards? Well, I would begin right when you start the antibiotic, I would, I would probably start with um, S. boulardii, Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a fungus, and it helps uh, keep you from uh, getting that darn uh, antibiotic diarrhea. <laughs> and then the next thing I would do is get on a, myself, I would get on a product called Bravo, and Bravo was uh, formulated uh, by Dr. Marco Ruggiero, who worked for the NIH, and he's a cellular uh, microbiologist. He's also a medical doctor. And uh, 
there's about 400 different species in this Bravo. Uh, of bacteria. Of bacteria. So you're not talking about a prescription medication, you're talking about a supplement here. A supplement. To replace the, the, yes. the good bacteria that should, that should be in your gut. Exactly right. There's also phages in there, in, in Bravo. And what phages are, bacteriophages, they're viruses, they're beneficial viruses. It kills off bad bacteria, but doesn't harm the good bacteria. So it allows that balance to stay there. So aren't all viruses bad? Or just, no. the, or just the man-made ones that we were, we were, we were <laughs> thrust upon just us? Just the ones that are patented. Y yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, we're <laughs> laughing about it. It's nothing to laugh about, no. but, but, no, um, but um, no, there are viruses. That was the case, wasn't it? Yeah, there's vi there's, there are beneficial viruses that exist as commensal organisms in our intestines. So we have a mix of fungi, viruses, bacteria, even things called acromancia, which aren't uh, they're not bacteria, they're just uh, methane-producing organisms. They're in there, too. But um, Viruses have a funny position in life. Uh, they're not a bacteria, and they're not a fungi. Mm -mm. They're, they're like a whole separate species that kind of mimics both. Yes, and they're just like these little fragments of um, DNA or RNA that hang around and look for a host. Yeah, they're, they're not really <laughs> alive. No, they're not alive. They're just sitting in the corner waiting for a host to pick them they're up. They're basically a parasite. Exactly, and they're, uh, it's a very small, you know, microscopic parasite. And then it, it, it takes over your cell. It gets into your body, it injects its own genetic material into your normal cell, and it infects the cell and takes over the cell. And, uh, and that cell becomes almost a zombie cell. Exactly. So chiropractic care has this more of a holistic approach. Yes. So how do we integrate this holistic approach with nutrients and so forth to stay healthy? You know, uh, proactive is better than reactive. Yeah. Always. Always, right. So how do, how do we do that? Well, y we have to look at the body as a whole because it's, 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 all, it's all integrated with how you function, your skeletal system, your uh, your mental mood, you know, your stress, how you handle stress, your stress levels, and the chemical aspect, which is nutrition. So, nutrition and supplementation. And supplementation, exactly. Because right. everything's not in the food. Right, and people get really confused with supplementation because there's so many supplements out there. And I look at supplements as you know, you have targeted supplements and you have general supplements that, that probably everybody should be taking. And I think it makes it real easy. The general supplements. Or like vitamin D, everybody should take. Um, fish especially oil. Especially here. Yes, especially where we live, where there's no, no sun. sun. <laughs> and, and fish oil, um, you know, the, the jury's out on it. I mean, there's a lot of studies on fish oil, but I'd like to parent essential oils myself better. That's uh, even though they say, oh, you can't convert enough of it to omega-3, but I've seen a, a few studies that it really... I think the parent essential oils, for me, I like them better. I think they're safer. Because fish oil, there's always a certain amount of toxin, no matter what. No matter how they... Mercury, lead, oh, whatever. Oh, mercury, lead, all that. And plus, on top of that, we got to remember, fish oil is antifreeze for fish. Mm -hmm. They live in these cold waters. It's like antifreeze for them. So when we put it in our body, what's our body, 98.6 or somewhere thereabouts? Average. It's going to oxidize. So if you're taking a lot of fish oil in, you could be creating a lot of free radicals through oxidation. And free radicals are damaging. Yes, very damaging. So what is the holistic viral treatment protocol? Well, this was developed by Dr. David Brownstein. He's one of my functional medicine doctors. So I, I'm, I'm certified in functional medicine through Functional Medicine University, and now I'm working on a second certification through Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. And um, he has been treating viruses for 40 years. He's a medical doctor. And it doesn't matter, I, I know we, we had some kind of virus in 2020, right? But, <laughs> but uh, this is for all viruses, not just for that one. And what, he, what we did was um, very early on, as soon as the patient has symptoms, you know, you don't wait for them till they can't breathe. You, you do it, as soon as there's symptoms, we start on, on high level vitamins. So vitamin D, 50,000 I use. Vitamin A, 100,000 I use. Vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams every waking hour and um, iodorol, which is an iodine, 25 milligrams. You do that for four days. Then we ramp it back down to, to more normal dosages. But if they have trouble breathing, we make a little concoction for them to use a nebulizer. It has to be a plug-in that has a compressor. 
and we mix 0.9% saline, 16 ounces, with three quarter, three fourths of a teaspoon of 12% food grade hydrogen peroxide. And you mix that little concoction up, you put a half a teaspoon in the nebulizer cup, and you put two drops of Lugol solution that you can buy online. And like he says, not true Lugols, but there's iodine in it. And you nebulize that every hour until you feel better. It might be four or five days. Once you feel better, you do it every four hours for a couple of days, and then you're done. And you know we had a lot of patients do that. And luckily, praise the Lord, we had nobody die. <laughs> so you brought some supplements, but you know we yeah. we're actually ran out of time to show them. Oh, so okay. We're gonna have to get you back for okay. some reason here. No, no, no not a problem. <laughs> the reason I brought those is we're working with the, uh, Dr. Paul Arciero, and he did some studies that are in peer-reviewed journals, and it's for metabolic dysfunction, which I have. So you know I've I've been on this roller coaster. I lose 60 pounds and I gain it. And then, um, but this I'm going to start in the beginning of January with Dr. Paul and, and Gary, Dr. Gary Fiber, and we'll be on here on the yeah, show well, talking about it. We're going to do it on the radio yeah. show first, and then we'll get yeah. you here in January yeah. to, to, to do some TV shows on that topic. Perfect. We're at the end of the show, Dr. Joe. Thanks so All much. Right, thank you. Thanks for having me. How can people get a hold of you very quickly? Just uh, my phone number is 724-929-6077. Again, that's 724-929-6077. And I think we have that up on the graphic. Yes. Thank and you. That's the best way to get a hold of me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, we're at the end of the show. You can listen to me live every Saturday morning at AM 1250 The Answer from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. for the Dr. Red Show. And, of course, you can follow us on rumble.com. Remember, a healthy pet is a happy pet. When you're healthy, you're happy as well. God bless. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. <laughs>